Okay, after that awkward 10 seconds of sitting around while music <laughs> plays with nothing in it, we are here. We're in Melbourne. Backchat Melbourne. Welcome. Uh, Backchat double underscore on socials. You can find everything we do, backchatpodcast.com.au. Thanks to our supporters, our sponsors, Shelter, Whippersnapper, Bluebet, Margaret River Roasting Co. and Leadable Cameras. We've got Jimmy Bartell in the house. G'day, mate. G'day, guys. You've got a long list of uh, <laughs> sponsors. <laughs> yeah. I um yeah I mean we're very well supported and we do yeah. you know everything that happens here is because of those guys so we do like to say thank you. Not great with the introductions here at Backchat Jimmy. So we know you've done a fair bit on the football field mate. You've won most awards that you can ever win. You've been all Australian, you've won premierships. We know you're a good football player, right? You've played a lot of games. We want to know off the top what's your greatest ever sporting achievement? Not on the football field. Now, you've been asking a lot of questions about the trophy sitting in front of yes. you on the table, which we will get to that, but we want to know about you. Greatest ever sporting achievement, not on the footy field? I uh, got a hole in one. I think that's all. Oh, very, that's huge. Yeah, I, I think everyone that's looks for so that, good. don't they? And, uh, Where? Tell, talk to it. 13th Beach. Uh, windy. Windy at 13th yeah. Beach. Oh, it was 100 kilometre hour winds, <laughs> about 400 metres out. No, um... <laughs> So the seventh hole, which sort of tracks along the coastline there at Bowen Heads, if people know it well, it's sort of tucked in there. It's down the back, the beach course, the, um, call it the older course, the 13th beach. Um, took the plastic off the seven iron for the first time. Really? It was a new set of clubs. Oh. Um, swung it in. Um, I'm no longer a member of 13th beach, so I can admit this. I was playing with a former teammate and we've, we think that's gone in. And instead of driving the buggy, as you know, they want you to go right wide around the greens. We drove the buggy right up to the hole. <laughs> <laughs> Both left, left out. And uh, yeah, we, we went mad. Yeah, absolutely mad. There's, you don't have any footage of driving onto the green with the buggy, do you? No, no. We kept it all, <laughs> all under wraps. Lucky it was right down the back so they couldn't see us from the clubhouse. That's unreal. That. What's that? Because people play golf their whole life and never hit a hole in yeah. one. But have you ever thrown away that? Seven iron, or is that that's no, going to no, be framed still, in the house? No, I still got the clubs. I um, did the real wanker thing and signed the date on it. <laughs> yeah, um, good. no, that's good. No, well, because footballers we uh, suffer a lot of concussions. I was just making sure I wouldn't forget it and uh, just have a memory starter in a few years. If we use this, is it maybe you need to mount it just like this cricket ball? Now, Jimmy yeah. sat down. Yeah. Lots of stuff going on here. There's shelter. There's whippersnapper. Mm. We've got yeah. a. He said, "What is this? Yeah. What is this yeah. trophy, Dan? Yeah. Why don't okay, you let so, him know, mate? Uh, under twelves. Uh, I've never actually heard this on the podcast before. <laughs> Every time. Tells every person. Um, under 12's Chuit Hill Cricket Club. And you're not from WA, so you wouldn't know. Nah. Chuit Hill, Hill's premier club over there. Yeah, top um, flight I've heard, yeah. <laughs> Chuit Hill Lions. Chuit Hill. <laughs> um, so grand final comes along, team's not doing well. Coach comes through the ball. He's like, mate, I need you to do something here. Pull something out. I said, no worries, leave it with me. Um, a few overs later, five wickets for 16 runs in the grand final. Um, cleaned Did you win? Up, cleaned up the tail end the and, we, and we lost. Oh. Oh, I think you just gave away the main headline. You cleaned up the tail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I was on a hat-trick um, as well. So I, I bowled uh, in, in the, the fifth wicket. Was I was on a hat-trick ball and then the first uh, ball of the next season was a was a no ball off the pitch. What, so. what are we bowling here? Are we bowling Leg right spin. arm? Did they turn? Mate, yeah. and, mate uh, five wickets it mate, says yes. There's two questions I've got. Um, <laughs> I love this. Yeah. It's clearly on hard wicket because it's a very, it's a two-piece. Yeah, tough. Yeah. And um, this ball tampering that's been going on. <laughs> What's happened? It's, what is that? It's very Vernon Philander picking at that's, the seam sort of. Nah, that's a little burn mark. Sometimes I put that much spin on it as soon as it hits oh, the yeah. ground. Oh, it boy. Just on the of, synthetic. Yeah, um, it just burns. So, no. Oh, and another bit. Are they... <laughs> We're going to get to Jimmy at some <laughs> yeah. stage. Are they, are they five skied catches in the outfield where they just... <laughs> I've, been, I've never actually asked that. So I remember I bowled one of them and then I think the four was just like shit gets wickets, you know, yeah. like some pies that you get caught at a square leg. So. I just can't imagine you. <laughs> I just... I just can't imagine the scenes that would have been happening with you coming off <laughs> four-step run-up, <laughs> swinging them in, spinning them around. All right, let's get yeah. to your career, mate, and chat about footy and the journey and some, some yarns. You're Geelong boy, so that's giving you a big tick of approval in my mind. Appreciate Geelong it. boy too, well done. But you went to St. Joey's. Yeah. So, I mean, you've taken that off the board now. So, a big cross in my mind, St. Joey's. St. Joey's, Dan, uh, not the rival school, different school systems, but they are just down the road from my school, Geelong right. College. So, they're both right in the centre of town. And St. Joey's boys, they rate, they, they rate their football ability. Uh, they, I mean, St. Joey's, Geelong College, if we played off different school system, who's going to win? Oh, well, 
rivalry, I, I think you've been pretty liberal with, with that, <laughs> that word. Like a rival, rivalry, I'd assume, for your listeners that it was close. <laughs> right. And, you know, like they'd win one, we'd win one. But um, it was embarrassing and um, <laughs> disappointing, really, whenever – well, the couple of times I met – the John College. I know I'm a bit older than you, so clearly things obviously improved after you know uh, I left school for Geelong College yes. down the road. So, but the fact that they didn't score against us was an issue. Gosh, uh, did they play a game? Geelong yeah. College played a game against St Joey's and didn't score. No, I think it was um, 28 goals, 20 to zip. I think. <laughs> <laughs> didn't know that. Yeah, that didn't is know brutal. That. So that's what I'm saying. Yeah, obviously <laughs> they, they took that on board. <laughs> Um, because actually, um, yeah, your your season with Geelong College, you're in the APS system and you you play for your school. And yep. it was in the lead up to that, and college and grammar said one after another, "Can you be some practice games?" And we're like, "Oh, by all means." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but, but at that stage, um, out of our starting 18, 15 of them were on the Geelong Falcons list, and there was um, seven Vic Country reps in that side. Well, wow, like, so, what's the names? People oh, know. Like, there, there was Nick Maxwell, Higgins, a <laughs> um, couple of guys who, like, didn't go on, but, like, they Good were big players. Um, Jimmy Allen, multiple McGarry medalist. Um, so. Meanwhile, Sean College has got a couple of nerds <laughs> down there running around. Yeah, some real uh, pencil bushes. <laughs> didn't, quite, didn't, didn't quite go down as well <laughs> as I would have liked, but the Geelong College in 2006, we won the premiership, Jimmy. Yeah. I don't know if you remember... I do. You were down there. <laughs> you were down there coaching a little bit with Ron Watt. Ron Watt yes. had you boys down there. You're running a couple of handball drills for the boys. Yep. Fair to say that the premiership from Geelong College was driven by the one and only Jimmy Bartell. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take as much credit as possible. <laughs> no, but, uh, Ron, do you remember that? Yeah, I, I do actually. Ron, Ron Watt was um, he was a great um, coach down at Geelong. He coached the Geelong VFL premiership side, which my first year because we had um, ten guys drafted. At Geelong, he was in charge of all that riffraff, and we won the the VFL Premiership so, under Ron Watt. So two thousand and two, two thousand two. So yep. they had like Ablett Junior, Kelly Johnson, go back a couple of uh, drafts. Had Chapman, Josh Hunt. Right. So, so the was crew. That, was it? it was that. It was the crew that then went on and, and yeah. played footy. Yeah, it was stacked. Right. <laughs> and so and you and you boys played together as as juniors because you get yeah. you get drafted uh, at the end of two thousand one. Yep. Top ten draft pick. It's the it's the super draft. It is the super draft. I had a look through it. I, I knew the top three in Jard, Hodge, Ball, mm. but it's a proper super draft. There's five Brownlow medalists in it. Yeah, and there's some guys at the back end of the draft. I think um, uh, Paul Brock. Salmon was in your draft. Yeah. You know that? Yeah, yeah, we'll play. <laughs> <laughs> Paul <laughs> Salmon. Yeah. Um, Brian Lake Harris was in that. Yes. Like a, he was very late. He was one of the last picks yep. in that, and we know what he went on to do. Uh, I think Sam Mitchell. Yep. Uh, Dane's, Dane's do you know Spons the five Brownlow medalists? We well, got two of them right there. Uh, or then Ga- Gaza, Juddy. Uh, there you go. There's the five. There you go. Yep. Yeah. You. Yeah, me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <of course>. yeah. <laughs> so that super draft, you, you know, you go through school. Who are you playing local footy for? Or is it? Uh, just I was playing at Bell Park. Even yeah. though I went to school at St Joey's because, um, just back to that point, Joey's played on Wednesday against the big Melbourne schools like St Bernard's, yes. De La Salle. So you play, could go back and play club football. Yes. And so you're in the Mick, Tw- Mick Turner Footy Factory. Yes. Um, get spoken about a lot these days, but it probably started around when you boys getting picked up because Luke Hodges, yep. Geelong boy, Gary Albert Jr.'s out of there, Jonathan Brown's out of there, Cameron Ling before you, I believe, is from there. He's a yeah, Joey's yeah, boy. Yeah. Um, and what's that sort of time? You look back and you hear the Geelong Falcon Footy Factory talked about, but is that – a big part of your junior footy playing for the Geelong Falcons yeah because um, they do it so well down there that they have squads throughout and as you know being a Geelong guy there, there's so many interleague and rep footy and um, I think people who haven't been to Geelong don't understand how much of a heartland of AFL football that is there's over 40 local football clubs schools embrace football there's a newspaper Geelong Addy that might as well be a football magazine really <laughs> <laughs> every week and the passion and Actually, the understanding and court, um, the knowledge of the game is enormous down there. So you have to be connected in football some way. So uh, I remember at one stage at, at 15, you're in a Geelong Falcons squad. I'm playing school football. There's the GFL Interleague. And then it's just all this rep football. So you're playing three and four games of actual competitive football a week. Yeah, so. do you remember that time? Because I look at that. I was watching my little nephew playing yeah. out at Geelong Ammo um, a couple of days ago. And, and there was kids playing there. It was their third game of the weekend. Yeah. 
Do you wonder, like, and then going into AFL footy, how you used to do that as a kid? Yeah, I, I think um, when I was 16, I, I reckon I played about 45 games of football in the, in the year. No wonder I ended up getting glandular fever and was absolutely cooked and falling asleep. But you had that to then to your trainings. And yeah. then, like most kids, you're playing basketball and other stuff as well. So um, I guess putting in the groundwork or laying the foundations of your footy, it certainly does that. You wore a helmet in the TAC Cup, school footy. Yeah. yeah. I, who, who enforced that? Uh, my mum was pretty big on it, um, raised by a single mum down there. And I, th- I think she got um, a little bit upset or uh, tired of me spending the weekend on the couch because I, I copped a, a couple of big hits in the head when I was about 15 and 16. And one of them in particular was obviously umpiring. It's hard to get umpires, as we know. And so if it was in your front half, you had to throw the, the ball in. Right. You'd have you'd have an opponent stand next to you so the numbers are even. But obviously what happens is if you're inside forward 50, you're trying to put it at the top of the square with the throw in. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, did, you ever, did anyone ever get told to redo it because it yeah, was too... Yeah, if you're taking the piss, they'd like, <laughs> do you bring that back? But the umpire's in the middle, he's volunteering. He's going, oh, I just want to wrap this up. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the ball got thrown in, comes out the back. I'm trying to save a goal because it's going to get kicked off the ground. But I got there first and the ball actually came underneath my stomach as a slid on it but someone was still still going to kick it off the ground and literally used my head as, oh, as a football and I was I was crook for a, a pretty long time so mum thought give the helmet a go for so I had the helmet on for about 18 months of my junior career did, oh. did it um, you know some guys wear yellow boots some guys mm. do this and that do you think it got you any extra notice I mean your football did the talking obviously yeah. but no Mick Turner didn't think so he thought it made me look slow and cumbersome and all that sort of stuff <laughs> Mick he, he goes get that off get, <laughs> get the stack hat off as he called it yeah. so, sorry just worrying about worrying about my future mental health and my brain yeah, health yeah. Mick reckons get the foot get the jumper off get, yeah. get the helmet off so yeah. why why didn't you take that into AFL did you feel like did you ever wear it I, no I, I didn't I wear it at f- AFL I've still got it at home um, there's a couple of times I'm lucky I had it on because it actually took a, a big rip out of it um, look there's, without getting too deep in it, the science is still out on whether helmets actually have an effect on concussion mm. because obviously, you know, brain's rattling in the head. Is it another layer on top of that? There's a lot of science you can go into it, but I sort of really used it just for the 18 months after I had that pretty big blow to the scone and um, didn't feel like I needed it after that. I don't, it didn't affect the way I played. Um, you played in an incredibly successful period at the football club. I was a Geelong fan growing up. Um, would have been... I didn't have number three on my back, but... Oh, um, who did you have? Um, 29? No, uh, absolutely not. I'm a backman, so... Scarlet. Um, no, close, but um, I'm, I'm a bit older than that, so uh, 39. Darren Milburn. That's correct. Yeah. So I was a Darren Milburn fan, and I wrote him a letter one day. And he wrote, he wrote back. I'm fairly sure he wrote back because I, I do remember it. Mm-hmm. And, and now knowing, sort of going through and you get letters sent to the club, the fact that he wrote back, yeah. good man, Darren Milburn. Great man. I was actually talking about him the other day. Um, his 250th game, yeah, milestones, you send a milestone, go, go flip the coin. Yes. And he's one of the driest speaking guys you've ever come across. He went and flipped the coin, playing down obviously at Geelong, blowing a gale down there, <laughs> comes back. He go, you know, where are we going, Dasher? His nickname, go, kicking into the wind, fellas. Oh, we lost it to us. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> we're like, what are you doing? So he kicked into the wind. <laughs> he goes, we're kicking into the wind. Like, it's slow and dry. And then we go, why'd you do that? He goes, because we're already up this end. He didn't want to walk down the <laughs> other end to start his starting position. <laughs> That's his 250th. <laughs> his 250th. Oh, yeah. what a legend. Yeah. See, this is why yeah. Dasher. Yeah. I mean, he had that big clash against Carlton, yes. um, which... For me, it, like it actually it actually shaped, you know, I, I've always seen physical contests as part of footy and we've seen it getting probably less and less with some of the rulings that have come in. And I remember that because he was my favourite player and he copped a lot of external slack and had the walking off the ground of the Carlton fans, that sort of stuff. And it always stuck in my mind that I never saw him as a bad person because he'd written the letter back. But, you know, it was an action, probably wasn't the best thing to have done on the football field, but I've always sort of rolled out the, you know, things happen on the football field that might not necessarily reflect you as a person so i do remember that i mean yeah well one thing he probably shouldn't have done is after you've knocked out the favorite son of carlton history stephen silvani stephen silvani you probably shouldn't give the the carlton crowd at their home ground the finger (laughs) (laughs) so that's inciting at the best (laughs) that's what he did hard to to excuse that (laughs) 
he literally that's he walked off giving it to him yeah. he was probably copping his fair share yeah, he, he just was. wanted something back <laughs> so uh, you start in 2002 you win that premiership in the VFL um, and that group of players goes on to great success you win three premierships together um, but it wasn't all roses you know 2006 and then um, or 2006 there was a game against West Coast you know we're a West Australian podcast um, they go on to win the premiership that year in 2006 one of the greats if not the greatest last quarter comeback of all time did you play in that game I did actually 56 points they came down from yeah it wasn't my fault because uh, <laughs> <laughs> you kicked a you kicked a goal at three quarter time I think to put them up to yeah put you guys up by six goals yeah nah, I, yeah I think uh, halfway to the third they were yeah. 54 points up and then they you were, were, you yeah, were. They were starting to, to chip away. And then, yeah, I think just on three-court time, I think I kicked one, as you mm. said, around six goals. But, you know, Kerr, Judd, Cousins. Reasonable. Some, yeah, yeah, some reasonable running power through the Hunter, midfield. Hunter. Yeah, like you <laughs> hardened, matured. You know, they're right in their premiership window, that, that sort of era there. So, yeah, that, that was a steep learning curve, to say the least. No doubt. So 2006 was, you know, it wasn't a great year for the footy club. Mark Thompson, your coach, there was murmurings around him getting sacked or potentially getting sacked, which, I mean, you're dealing with some coaching stuff with your role at GWS mm-hmm. now, so I guess you've come full circle in that extent. But um, 2007, you start poorly. Um, two, two and three in the yep. first five rounds, and you play North Melbourne um, and... I was at that game. I was standing up on the um, the standing area up the back. Mm. So this was 2007, my first year at the club at West Coast. I got drafted at the end of 2006 and I came back and I watched the footy with my two brothers standing on that asphalt area up there, like the last one of the last AFL grounds to have standing area. So and it was a bad loss. Yeah. And it's been reported and we've seen it across media that there was a you know player meeting, player driven meeting. Is that is that how it went? Was it a, was it everyone out? Someone up the front, not going to cop this shit anymore. Standards yeah. need to change. Yeah, there's a bit of backstory that all sort of builds up to it. And it, as you touched on quite rightly, it, it was cons- a bad year, 2006. But sometimes I think when people look at it, they think we won three or four games. We won ten and a half games. Yeah. So when we see sides go down the bottom, they go, I oh, just do a Geelong. I go, hang on a minute, you guys have only won two games. So yes. <laughs> we won ten and a half. Yes. Um, but I think what made that worse was the fact that as a young side, we made a prelim in 04. Yep. The, as they call it, the bloody Nick Davis game yep. in 2005. So we were competitive, but then to drop off, that's where the disappointment came. Of course, as you mentioned, there was a big review. Bomber stays in place, and it was almost a, a newer and refreshed Bomber and coaching panels. We were trying to copy what West Coast were doing in Sydney, those grand finals, man on man, 60 beats 50 points. You, you grind it out. Yes. But our talent didn't lie in that. It was attacking aggressive players, and I think Bomber thought, well, if they're going to sack me, they might as well sack me playing the way I actually want to coach. And that's that fast ball movement sort of stuff. And we trained it all summer, started to look good, and then you have a couple of losses. And then, as you mentioned, that North Melbourne loss was a bad loss because we were expected to win again. And, yeah, the Geelong fans, oh, here we go again. We've <laughs> yeah. been through the 90s, losing grand finals. And we back down, we rebuilding. And as, as you mentioned, there's players sitting around after that game. And it was – Bomber started off and he goes, well – I'm probably going to be sacked and probably half of you are going to probably cop it in the neck as well if we keep going this way. What do you want to do? do we, are we all doubling down and going with this game style that we worked out over summer, which is fast play on handball, or do we revert back to our age-old ways and we, we look after ourselves and just grind out? One-on-one yeah. defence. Yeah, and we just have another so-so season. And then also you've got senior players, and we mentioned him before, Darren Milburn, he wasn't that old, but he goes, look, I don't have long in the game and I want to win, so let, let's go for it. And then it all f- flowed off the back of that and we came out the next week and beat Richmond by about 1,000 the next week at Marvel Stadium and, you know, winning. I think a lot of people think losing is a, a big motivating factor, but winning can be just as big. Mm. And when you celebrate that winning and, you know, playing a certain way, I think we just launched off the back of that. And the confidence associated yeah. with it. Like, it's mental. As much as, okay, you had a yeah. game plan, you're going to attack mm. and you're going to do all this... You still got to do it, but you still got to believe you could do it, right? Yeah, you got to see it works. Yeah, you're like, oh, it actually works. Like, you know, hang on, we just keep 20, 30 goals in a game. Oh, th- this can work. Yeah, yeah. So two thousand and seven, you win the Brownlow. Yeah. So it's a pretty good year. But yeah. it starts. I mean, it doesn't start. You know, people think, oh, Brownlow, Norm Smith, Grand Final, Premiership. Oh, how good's that? Yeah. Uh, first Brownlow I went to. 
Um, I've been to forget, forget a go to it. You may as well yeah, win yeah. it. Um, went with a former Geelong College student, actually, Tim Kellen. Um, he he yes. was my date. I remember. So you'd seen the light by this stage. You, you, you've moved over from the St. Joey's glory uh, days. Uh, if you can't, you've got to fake it until you make it. So <laughs> hang around some high class Geelong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not, not working class Bell Park. But Very good. Uh, we, uh, we went in his old old bomb and um, pulled up and there's beautiful cars and I'm seeing like Mark Rusciuto, all guys I like, admired and loved, previous Brownlow winners all there. And we're in this old shitty car and you're at the valet of Crown, they're like, what the hell is that? And like, it's almost like a dumb and dumber moment, like park that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what was it? What sort of car was it? It was like a red Cortina thing. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, um, but I, I wanted to get it a vote, like going to your first Brownlow. I knew I had a pretty good year. I th- I was equal favourite for a lot of it, but my appendix burst and I missed the last two games of the year. So yeah. I thought, oh, if I'm in it, I, I don't want to miss because of an appendix and things like that. So that was always in the back of my mind. But as the night unfolded, I polled three votes before my appendix burst and they couldn't catch me. So I got to sit and watch the last two rounds. So you'd won? I'd already won the Brownlow. Really? Oh, but I'm sort of... You sick. weren't drinking either because yeah, grand final. Yeah, grand final. But it was almost... Um, a Ricky Bobby moment. Like, I didn't know what to do with my hands because all, <laughs> all, all of the cameras are on you. And, like, I'm like, oh, shit. shit. And yeah, Bruce, he and his boys, are, you've won it, Jimmy. <laughs> After round 20, I'm like, what? Um, what do I do? Like, all of a sudden, I'm itchy. Like, uh, I've got to do something now. And then two rounds go by. Adam Goods, who I knew, we had the same manager, ripping fella. And Goods, he's like, how you feel? Like? And... He leans in to shake my hand. I go, I'm shit myself here. Like, yeah. what a, like, I just couldn't believe I was in the same room with all these guys. And Brownlow went back. And I used to live over the road from a, a big pub in Geelong, uh, the Cremorne Hotel. Beautiful yeah. establishment. I lived there with um, f- four teammates. But everyone over the road, because we were always over there, they were Polacks at the Cremorne. And they completely covered the house. They'd like stolen like the gumball machine. They'd put it all <laughs> on the front. And as we come back, Tim's like, we well, can't stay here tonight. So we went down. His family lived in Bowen Heads and spent the night down there. So you've gone down in the red Cortina with Tim, Tim yeah. Callan. I mean, we, we, we were, you, you knew you were a chance. You don't just win the brown though. And it's like, oh, geez, I won the, won the brown though. Like you'd had a great year. Yeah. They had eight best on grounds. Did yeah. you think you were going to win rocking up? No, because I always had in the back of my mind, I missed the last two. And then a game in the middle of the year, I got knocked out in probably the first five minutes. So I go, well, I'm automatically three games down. Mm. The game after being cast, I was a bit still gaga, I reckon. Yes. Um, so probably three, four games down, I thought, oh, I'll get some votes, of the ones I played well, but we'll see how we go. Ricky Bobby sitting there with his hands. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, <laughs> the camera's in the face. And when you look back on it, I'm going, oh, jeez, what do I do next? I remember um, cause Shane, we were talking to Shane Woden, and, and he was talking about how towards the back end of the count, you know, the cameras just sort yeah. of kept hovering around him and he was like, well, I think I probably, like they know, you know, because yeah. it was right close at the end. And yeah, when you got the cameras on you constantly, I guess you, I mean, I don't know what you'd do with yourself. Like yeah, exactly. look or sitting there, there's no food, there's no nothing. It's because you're playing, you can't have a, a nervous sip of beer like, <laughs> like this. So you're just sort of sitting there with your hands in your lap, but you're right. There's a camera like literally right there. Does yeah. speech go okay? I think so. I don't, I don't I, know. I, I haven't yeah. wa- I've watched it, but... Yeah, thank, thank your mum, thank your teammates, yes. Yes. all that sort of stuff, and I think you can't go wrong. You don't want to, fit, you don't want to forget anyone. No. Um, yeah, I mean, you've played with some greats of the game. You mentioned them yeah. all before. You know, Ablett, Johnson, Corey, yeah. Enright, Joel Corey, Corey Enright, yeah. um, Scarlett. Uh, well, you go through that period of your building and then you go through this great period of success. You win three premierships. With all those greats, what drives the success is it um is it preparation is it competitiveness is it uh training standards what is it yeah it's all of that and i think it goes back to when they pretty much drafted those the two main drafts and the one either side of them so like i'm talking my draft which is gaza kelly johnson lingy's draft which is joel corey corey and right paul yes. chapman and then either side of a couple of hours those you add mackie lonigan Josh Hunt and Max Rook. Yeah. So it's almost like four years coming through. A lot of businesses and football clubs say they talk about character and things like that. But through that era in particular, John really focused on it. Aggressive, competitive guys. Now you have to be talented, of course. 
but there was a massive focus on that, which then training drills turned into a, a flat out competition. Mm. Everything was to compete. Um, a lot of drills were designed that way under Bomber was match practice, match sim sort of stuff. So it's the competitive as, as you're talking about. Winning is a pretty bloody good feeling being at the top and you just want to stay there. So all, all that definitely um, kept driving what Shalong was doing. And you guys know in the West, it can be, it can be really good um, as well that you can sort of be a bit removed. Like you're not in Melbourne, the focus, yeah. you sort of get ignored. Like you don't have... For Geelong, yeah, there's media, but people in Melbourne think Geelong's 10 hours away. Like, it's an hour away and <laughs> there wouldn't be any media. Like, you just go about your business, guys train their backside off and they probably hit the golf course and go out and fishing. It's just a unique environment. you got, you got the Addy out the front, that's yeah, about it. Yeah. You don't have a media scrum. Yeah, you're going, hey, mate, yeah, you're going, you got something? Nah, we're all good. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, my, my brother and my family and, you know, Geelong people, so big Geelong fans, uh, Mum, although um, I got drafted at the end of 06, seen the last premiership with Geelong 64. Yeah, 63. 63. Yeah. And so uh, I don't believe she was she was you know, a young girl at that stage. Mm. Oh, this, this is showing what... Yeah, no, young girl at that stage. So she'd seen that, but then nothing in between. Supported West Coast 2007. So butchered that. But my family is very <laughs> Geelong orientated. And my brother, a uh, very big football fan, Speaks about a man that he's rated in his top five most influential players of all time at the Geelong Cats over that mm. successful period. And for mine, it was a bit surprising. I'm wondering if you agree. Brad Ottens, he's got yeah. him in his top five in terms of his importance to the team. Like, yes, he had some great yeah. midfielders. Yes, he had a great back line, some goal-kicking forwards. Mm. But Brad Ottens' inclusion into it. Would yeah. you agree? Yeah, that's pretty pretty fair. And a number of reasons why. So, obviously, the on-field stuff, he was a champ like yeah. big ruckman um his tat work you know being underneath him he made your job so easy yeah. and it was the funniest thing all summer you know different midfields you know we're going to a one or a three or there's catch names like i think the eagles used suburbs there for a while yeah, yeah. um we actually used there was there were race courses that's right yeah so north, As- ascot northern northern, northern, northern. northern. yeah northern i go all right they're going to northern after a while i pick up on that one <laughs> but you tell Otto that all, all year and you get to the game and you just go, I'll oh, just go there. <laughs> 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 and he, but he did it down your throat. Un- underrated how good of a kick he was for, sh- for goal because when he played forward in his early days for the Tigers, yeah, he kicked big goals. But then I think the other factor too is for quite a while, Geelong were trying to attract a big name to come down with a key forward. Yeah. And you couldn't get him because they'd be like, oh, Geelong. 10 hours away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's 10 hours. Oh, it's a bit run down down there. It's, you know, it's not Melbourne. It's not all the glitz and glamour. And uh, I remember quite a few times we were in the market or in the running for the next big key forward coming out. And we couldn't get him. Mm. But then Otto committed and it was like, everyone's like, oh, oh, what's so good? Like he became the poster boy of, I don't want to be in Melbourne. I, I want to go like sit on my farm and I want to play golf. I want to go fishing and surfing. And he sort of led... He was the very first big, big name that, that came. But um, you, you think, yeah, big moment, 2007 prelim against Collingwood. He's ruck work, the junior. Yes. Like, just taps it down. Gazza snaps it from 40. But Otto's game, that game was massive. And he did it without hit zones. He did it without hit zones. <laughs> Gazza just, just out of here. Yeah, he, go, he like started nodding. I know that makes great audio. <laughs> just like nodding. Or he just pointing his finger like, there. <laughs> <laughs> and he would, but then um, oh, he, he was he was a star, the big fellow, and ripping guy. Yeah, that's great. Well, Jace is going to be happy with that answer, my brother, <laughs> because I, I was like, I don't, I don't know if that's true or not, but it yeah. sounds like yeah. my brother's right, I'm wrong, which is not a surprising thing. The long sleeve jumper. Yeah. Um, was that just protecting some spaghetti arms or what's, what's happening? <laughs> I mean, it didn't seem like a skinny sort of Matty Lappin type. No, no, ripped like Cows was in his prime. <laughs> yes. No, I don't think anyone was as ripped as Cows. No. Um, <laughs> now, uh, often people ask me, was it superstition or things like that? But I uh, openly admit I'm a coward when it comes to the cold. <laughs> um, I, I freeze and I always have since I was a kid. Um, days at Bell Park when they were woolen long sleeves, I'd wear that and then the short sleeve over the top the, during the Geelong Falcons. Or two jumpers. I just. It I'd, is Geelong. It yeah. is Geelong. Yeah, I'd, I'd still sweat and things like that, but I was frozen. It's like, even though I grew up in Geelong, the wind would get like in your bones sort of feeling. Yeah. And, and I'd shake. But because of training, um, I'd come into the huddle and Brendan McCartney would be like, 
you, seriously, mate, you can't come into the huddle with your hands over your ears because my ears freeze. <laughs> And he goes, it's such a bad look. Like, you got an experienced player, you got a young guy, and you're standing there with your hands on your ears. Guys, it's cold. And, uh, or I put him, like, down my jumper, and so he'd be, like, covering up all the cold bits. So he, he allowed me to train with the beanie on. Right. Cause I was like, Smart. Because otherwise I'd be just there, and he'd be, like, yelling and go, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Freezing my backside up. But, yeah, the long sleeves, I was comfortable in them. Um, I like to stay warm, and, yeah. It's good. Did, what did you have to... Um Announce. Well, did you have to like select that in a certain period of time, or did they just have one there ready for you just in case? Because like, if you go out there, and you're like, it's not actually that cold. Just go the short sleeve. Uh, well, we all know some property stewards are interesting beasts yeah. to start yeah. with. Yes. Um, they guard the stuff like um, it's their own. Um, That's correct. My my first year, I went to the property steward, and he didn't even know my name. He goes, Ah, you'll be out the door. <laughs> 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 I'm, like, I'm like, No, serious, mate. I need a long sleeve. And played one of my first VFL games up at North Ballarat. Now, that's proper cold. Yep. And Tim McGrath, the old grisly um, Geelong vet, um, was captain of the VFL that year. And all the young guys, all of a sudden, he's got long sleeves on. He went round him and goes, get that off, get that off. It's weak. <laughs> and he finally gets round to me. And, you know, I go, there's no effing chance, mate, or else I'm not playing. <laughs> I, go, I go, nah. I go, if I can't feel my hands, I'm not playing. And? And he goes, all right, all right, move, move on. I go, I go, mate, I respect you to everything, but there's not a single chance I'm getting this off. I've told this on the podcast before, but you appreciate it. So um, there's like the, the hallway of honour at West Coast, right, in yeah. the rooms. They've got all the 100 game players or the 150 games line the corridor and you get your picture up. And oh, for me, it was always a big moment to get up on yeah. the wall, right? <clears throat> well, um, there was, there was uh, this sort of a moment in the hallway um, uh, Ashton Hams was I'm just confirming I'm sure it was Ashton yeah, Hams So Ashton Hams Used to wear the long sleeve jumper um, In games He's probably one of the last West Coast Eagles player To wear one Because um, they stopped making them for us We're not allowed to wear them both, Pretty much um, Anyway he's walking along And Suma pulls him up And Suma has him in the Hall of Fame there And and he's going, mate. What are you wearing the long sleeve jumper for? You know, you need to get, you know, get the long sleeves off. Giving him a Tim McGraw moment. It's weak. You know, it's, <laughs> you can't be doing that. You look weak. You're playing weak. It's affecting your footy. Doing this and that. Effectively, had him like a choker hold up against the thing. <laughs> you can't wear long sleeve jumpers. He had him up against Peter Sumich's pitcher yeah. in his 150th game. Wearing a fucking long sleeve jumper. <laughs> Swimmer's got the long sleever on behind him. And Hammer's looking around like, hang on a second, mate. What's going on here? Old school values though, correct? Yeah, yeah abs- absolutely. Peter Sumich, geez, he used to give Geelong fans nightmares. Yeah. Like five goals off a wing, grand final. The, he, he used to... The, the West Coast... Well, the West Coast... Oh, Peter Matera. No, no, no sorry, Peter Matera. Peter Sumich, big, big Peter. Yeah, yeah, big swimmer. Sorry. So, but still, was, was a good player. Yeah, that, correct. That eagle side, so what about that? That Like, when I first moved over to West Coast, there was a real Geelong-West Coast rivalry, not too dissimilar to the Joey's College rivalry of about <laughs> 2002, but it was a real one, right? Yeah. And then they knocked him off in two grand finals, 92, 94. And then it sort of continued on. The West Coast had some success that game. Uh, is that something that existed? Like or even growing up as a Geelong, you were a Geelong fan growing up. I wasn't. I'd go to a, I'd go wow. to a lot of Geelong games because they'd swing the gates open at like three quarter time, and you'd be able to go in. So you kick the ball on that outside oval to St Mary's ground, and yep. and you go and watch the last quarter. I see, I ran on the ground when Gaz Senior kicked his thousandth goal. Uh, that was it, like Buddy. <laughs> was oh, I didn't get anywhere near him. It was like so far away. Yes. Um, but you'd see like Plugger come down. Uh, I saw a plug a kick like seven and a half against the Cats, standing in that outer area that you you stood in. Yeah. So, yeah, I'd go down and watch it. But I was a I was a Richmond supporter as a kid because a, a number of family were Richmond supporters. So I wasn't a, a diehard Tigers supporter. But yeah. if, if I got pressed as a kid, it was oh yeah, go to the Tigers. I mean, talking about Kidinia Park, let's touch on that a little bit. Um, like my childhood, I remember I used to try and be the first into the centre square because yeah. you used to be able to run on. Mm. Um, it used to be the same across. All ovals, although the G didn't used to do it. No, I don't no. know. I didn't go to the G much as a kid. No. But it was definitely Cadinia Park, yeah. right? Um, and then so you grow up around Geelong, you play in Geelong, and it's this incredible home ground advantage. Like your first 100 games at Cadinia Park, do you know how many games you won? You won a lot. 85. 85. Yeah. 85 in your first 100 at Cadinia Park. That's a nice home ground. Yeah. <laughs> so why, why is that? I mean, it's... It's an oval. It's got four sticks at each end. Yeah, I reckon there's a few factors. We were a pretty damn good side. Yep. That, so that helped. Um, I, I think the extra factor of if you're playing an interstate side, like you know, take the Eagles, you guys, you, I don't know whether you got on a bus before you went to the Perth airport. 
Perth Airport, yes, so sometimes. You, so you're doing that, then you're flying, then you get to Melbourne, then you get on a bus. It's a shocking trip. Yeah, and then shocking trip. As, you, as you're coming down the highway, you go, geez, I feel like I've pretty much travelled to <laughs> the US. It feels that long. Yes. It's probably hailing, coming yeah. in sideways, and you're driving past probably not the most picturesque surrounds of like Shell Refinery and <laughs> oh, the, the Ford the, Factory. The, the Ford Factory that's been closed down. And then you get there and it's windy and there's not one supporter there for you. Mm. It, it's not a great start. Yeah, uh, true. The game hasn't started, started yet. yet. And then you get on a ground that's not shaped like any other. Yeah, so talk us through that. So it's so it's long, but it's so narrow and it is a different way to play. So the ability for the wing, if you've, you can really train up your wingers and Geelong were able to do that. The wing can actually become an extra defender without playing as an extra defender because... Obviously, if you take it down one side, because it's so narrow, yes, the wing comes in. And if you've got marking wingers, which DeLong always had, you just become an intercept player the yes. whole, whole time. And then what a lot of sides get trapped doing is they try and take the entry from too deep because it's too long. So they hit, get to the logo, and then they try and kick inside forward 50. Now you're shallow. Just shallow. And you're just hitting that spot where, as I said, the wing's there, and DeLong train their defenders all to come off and intercept. But they've caught you all the wrong numbers on the wrong side of the ground. Yes. So that's why then they just ping it back up through the middle. So it becomes almost like you have if you have it, that's great because then you're going to turn it back and you're all going to be out of position. How long have you been working with GWS for? Uh, this is my third year now. Oh, Charlie, <laughs> can you just check GWS's record at Cadinia Park, please? Because two wins down there. <laughs> so Jimmy <laughs> yeah. knows what it is. Yeah. Straight up. Because yeah. I, I just in the back of my mind, I think GWS would have some. They've had some good victories at the KP, yeah. and yeah. I've just yeah. heard the great man speak <laughs> here. Yeah, I know just my, wondering if there's some around. inside yeah. knowledge there. Yeah, I know my way around it, and I know the way Geelong plays it too. So they they like to. If they do turn over and turn slow, they, they use a term called fight for the outside. So they'll come and get to the boundary and yep. they'll make you choose which one do you want to defend. Yeah. And so everyone goes, oh, I've got to take that one out. But then they just ping you through up through the middle, ground yes. short. You've got half a dozen players now immediately out of the play defending. Yes. Called uh, perimeter at West Coast. Same, yeah. same term. Yeah. Trying to get the outside, yep. force them to take the wrong kick, turnover, goal. Yeah. Like that? Good. Yeah, Dan likes yeah, yeah. it. Dan likes the footy inside, yeah, yeah. and I think it's interesting. No, it's interesting. To yeah. Fight for the outside. Yeah. Okay. I was gonna say foff. No, it's not foff, is it? Uh, you, do you like Phil out of fishes? Do you? Uh, I actually used to have to mate them at McDonald's. I was a burger jockey. As one Stop of my the fucking <laughs> podcast yeah. right now. Yeah. <laughs> Talk. I don't care about your football career. Yeah. You used to <laughs> make Phil out of fishes. Yeah, I was a burger jockey, <sighs> as I like to call it, at McDonald's. Um, yes. Did one shift a week because all the sports. So you. Um, to be honest, it was to get the, about the twenty-eight dollars at that stage, which would get you a slab of VBs for the weekend party. <laughs> um, Geelong College did have good backyard parties. Compared, yeah, good. That that helps when had it's to a, be able to hold up. Well, it, it's a bit better when you got a co-ed school to work with and an all-boys <laughs> school for a backyard party. <laughs> Sacred Heart used to look after the Joey's yeah, boys, though, no yeah, doubt. Yeah, exactly. So you used to work at Macca's part time, and you you were flipping the fishes. Yeah, uh, well, um, Phil at a fish would go through. Um, absolutely bonkers during easter week you know when everyone goes to the fish and chips yeah just the just the one time of the year that anyone no, eats a no, fucking fill out of fish no, horrid right horrid yeah. is, is there fish in them do you think there's seafood in them no nah, they're like there's no chicken in <laughs> I, don't, I hope you're not sponsored by mcdonald's we're certainly not no. <laughs> fill out of fish has been a real area of um you know insight and we've never really spoken to someone who's actually been yep. in amongst it's us. sort yeah. of my like alternative go-to so like i'll get my standard thing but like I, it's I your do go-to like, I st- yeah. It's yeah. fish flavouring. It's like, you know, you can get an iced coffee, there's no coffee in it, but it tastes like iced coffee. You know, some of those brands? Mm. Yeah. That's what a fill of fish oh, is. is. It's just the bun for me. You know, yeah. like how the yeah. bun is treated so differently to any other bun. We've found out that, that the bun is actually not, and you'll be able to confirm. Oh, it's this like It's so soft and Do you moist. do anything different with the fillet of fish buns? Yeah, they go, the a, they go in a different, like, cooker, like baker thing. Because the cheeseburgers and Big Macs are all one department, so they get pressed. The McChickens and the fillet of fish go almost in like, it's almost like, yeah, like a steamer. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh. So you got McChi- <laughs> McChicken, fillet of fish, nuggets and apple pie at one station. That, that's how you get king, you, you king get, food over there. You get broken in. It. That, that's your starting point as you make your way in the McDonald's world. If Grow, you're, if you're gr- in the kitchen. Growing up in Geelong, <clears throat> used to wrap our house up in blue and white streamers. Well, I'm a huge Geelong fan. 
Big Jimmy Bartel fan. Watched him do all the things. But my favourite part out of the Jimmy Bartel interview is going to be his description of Phil and O'Fishers fishes and how to cook them. Well, when I, when I left that um, glorious role, um, flipping burgers and just hitting the reheat bit button on the nuggets instead of cooking new ones, um, I, I said to the yeah, I know who was the manager, I said, oh, look, I'm finishing up. And she goes... You, you'll be back. And I said, oh, pretty much. Oh, I won't be back. <laughs> <laughs> she goes, you don't have much going for you. And I said, oh, wow. okay, Is yeah. this a trend? You got the, the Maccas, you got the property steward at, at yeah, Geelong. Yeah. Did, did you feel like, I mean, you're a high draft pick, so you obviously had talent as a junior, but did you have, did that, was that proving people wrong? Was yeah. that ever something that? Um, I like keeping the bit of deception with it, you know, like don't look like a footballer, sneak up on them, you know, socks down, long sleeve. Yes. Yeah, just, yeah. He's Wait. obviously got receipts as well. He's brought up every every person yeah. in detail yeah. who's right. doubted him. Got a memory. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he's kept. <him. laughs> Brian Cook. He's yeah. t- spent time at West Coast. Yep. Um, you know, again, documented what he was able to do with the football club, with Geelong Footy Club, with the finance and the financial situation came in and turned a lot around there. What about as a player? Did he? You know, Trevor, Trevor Nisbet, the CEO at West Coast. Um, it, I always felt and then you know post career know that he was a real players CEO who mm. really gave a shit yeah <laughs> and it, it was was Brian Cook that sort of guy what sort of influence as a player did he have yeah he was and um, you know a lot of people say oh the door's always open but you, you felt like that with Cookie and if you didn't come up and have a chat he'd come down and find you <laughs> and he had a genuine interest in you as a person and you felt that so oh, yeah. you, you felt connected it wasn't one of those hallway chats hey yeah mate yeah good and then, you know they're, they're sort of half walking away from you it was genuinely engaged in you and it's back to that um, point that era of Geelong when Frank Costa became the president Brian Cook became the CEO and Bomber Thompson the coach um, Cookie's whole business model good to great and it was based off the character of the people in the club if you surround your club and your business with as many driven people well yeah eventually it's going to come up pretty good for you mm. Seven, nine, eleven, mm. all premierships. Um, is there a better one? Is there? And there's lots of questions we yeah. can ask you about, it, obviously. But do you, you know, speak to a lot of people as well about you got to lose one to win one. You didn't lose one. Um, oh wait, we lost when we no, were no, but 2007, COVID. right? Yeah, mm. you had that moment. You didn't have to lose one before you won that, yeah. but then you win, you lose oh eight. Yeah, it's that sort of period of time. Memories, great wins. Well, 07, uh, as you touched on, um, and, and you know, growing up in Geelong, um, you know, people, oh, no, isn't another one they're going to get to and lose because obviously 89, 92, 94, 95, 97, that prelim. Yep. Um, <coughs> so they'll jump you, to say the least. Yes. So the genuine vibe around Geelong was, oh, geez, oh, are we going to lose another one? But as soon as you understand that you don't own the past failures, it, it, the, the weight comes off the shoulders. Like, we don't own the 44 years as this playing group. We respect it and we understand the history, but I'm not going in for the first bounce against Port Adelaide going, geez, 92's on, on my shoulders. Like, <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm eight years old, nine years old. Like, what's that got to do with me? Yes. Like, it doesn't mean I, I disrespect it, but it actually has no impact on what we're doing. And so as soon as you sort of embrace that, it helped too that Bomber Thompson in the grand final week First thing he did was he goes, this is going to be the greatest week of your sporting life. Yes. He goes, invite friends and family, get on the phone, um, grand final parade, I want you smiling, happy, you see your mate, give him the thumbs up or the finger, I don't know what relationship <laughs> you've got with your good, really? good good mate. And it's like, as soon as the coach says that, because like, you, you see, like, oh, am I supposed to be dead serious? I can't, you know, I've got to focus on a game. He's like, don't worry about it. He goes, we're going to have fun training. I remember our last training session, a lot of people don't know this, but we, we train with a goat. Yeah. Excuse me? Yeah. And, and G- Gary Ablett Senior, I'm seeing the greatest yeah. of all time or a goat? No, not, not the, the goat title that we all refer to, like LeBron and Gaz Senior and Dom Bradman and all this, an actual animal, a farm animal, a goat. Please, please <laughs> expand. You've got the next 20 minutes <laughs> to yeah. explain the goat, please. <laughs> yeah. So part of lightening the mood um, during the year, and I don't know why it's always the case, Ruckman are funny. Yeah. It's because they're... You yeah. either laugh at them or you laugh with them and they, they think it's both the same. Those guys think, oh, they're all laughing with me. Like, Rockman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> North. Yeah. Just oh, here. Just here. Um, 
<laughs> so Stephen King, um, Henry Playfair, big ruck forward too, very, very funny guys. They started this thing on your main training session, just a light in the mood called the joke box. And so people are writing jokes, but it just turned out that they'd spent a couple of hours writing their own jokes. <laughs> <laughs> which, a couple of ruckmen. Yeah. Oh. And they'd present them to the group and it was very funny. It was more their presentation. And we had um, the stats guy, analytic guy, um, named Eugene and he had this horrible goatee and so most of the jokes just turned out to ripping him about his goatee <laughs> and so I got to grand final week and they're like right oh we've had um enough expense of Eugene's goatee it's about time um he got a reply so as soon as he's about to get up the front of the auditorium someone opens the door and this goat comes blasting into our meeting room <laughs> dressed in full cat's garb just like thrashing around like this and the place erupted <laughs> that would have been scream people would have been yeah, so... Just the grand final was, week. Yeah, our main training session, closed training session, there's helicopters going above, and our media guy's having a meltdown. He's like, oh, if the media get a hold of this, and he's trying to push people out, and there's this goat involved in match sim and things like that, and he's got cat's gear, it's pissing in the shorts, <laughs> and things like that. It was on the ground while yeah. you were doing training. Yeah, he was doing a full training session in cat's gear. I think I had Max Rooks footy jumper on they found one for it. <laughs> no yeah. no yeah. Is this, i've never seen this is it no, you said no, not, never got out no, which is has it post got out have no, you no. <laughs> have you just given us the greatest no, no, I, I think there's guys at, at like sporties and things like that when they're trying to make cashies and things like oh, that oh that is just outstanding yeah. can we find the goat with yeah. <laughs> but why why was it max rooks jumper oh I he think played like a bit of a goat because oh, he because he helped it was actually ron watts goat <laughs> had his property and so Ron, Ronnie and Max had got it and they'd like fed it all up and got it all you know nice and calm but as soon as it was like it's literally like when you, um, they do the bull riding and they open the gate it just came like kicking in and <laughs> <laughs> the boys would have loved it Gee, that's incredible insight so we can put down the greatest grand final winning margin down to a goat at training yeah pretty much yeah wow. yeah the secret recipe that what was incredible. um what was the reaction like from um the locals after 44 years like ending that like that's oh, yeah. huge weight lifted off people yeah it was um i think best way to describe it, it was a friendly riot <laughs> like they yeah. blocked off all the cbd there's people you know coming in they're hanging outside their cars um and you'd see like you look on youtube and that and you'd see all the police standing there but no one was a harm to anyone it was just like they just lost their mind for a couple of days <laughs> and it was awesome to be a part of um and you mentioned which one was best, but they all had different feeling. Like seven was just this pure relief and joy for all the fans. Oh nine was a bit of redemption, of course, from oh eight. Then two, 2011 was like a bit of the players and a bit of a sticking it to the footy industry. We lost our coach, lost the best player. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you guys are all done and dusted, and yeah, we romped home on that one. There you go. I was going to say the the friendly riot reminds me of um, what was the. Was there an NFL team? Was it Atlanta? They like greased the street yeah. poles and stuff so that people wouldn't climb them. Yeah, probably the best way to describe is, yeah, when in college football, they, they call it was a big boil over and they just rocked the, the post down. Yes. It was like that. It was like everyone's like, yeah, we're so happy. Let's just take stuff with us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it's that good. I can, I, I've seen the footage. You yeah. have to look it up. Yeah. It's incredible. Uh, Mad Monday's always been a big thing at Geelong. Mm. It's now, I reckon you as a past player would now be looking at, hey, boys, you know, you now got it. They're doing interviews out the front. They, yeah. It's it's getting bigger and bigger. That started when was that tradition of yeah. really dressing up and getting right into it. Yeah, um, myself, Matt Scarlett, Joel Selwood, and Joel Corey. Um, yeah, we we really pushed it along. The committee, uh, yeah, social committee. Yeah, so Joel Corey and I were um, part of like organising the day, and we'd have awards and all that sort of stuff. And um, we became the gatekeepers of what you're going to wear. Because you didn't want to double up, or right? Yeah, you know, we had to check see if we're well, going to get in. Surprise! So come and tell you. Yeah, hey mate, I've got this. Well, we're nice. Yeah, we don't mind it. Oh, you got an idea for us? Yeah, we got some ideas <laughs> for you. Like this. Um, but I think what made it different was like lots of clubs, local professional, do dress ups. But we went really down the pop culture path. You know, like yes. topical people, which I think kept uh, the broader community very entertained. Was there any big failures? At oh. your at your watch, by the sounds of it, because if you're um, the gatekeeper, mate, yeah. I reckon there has been across the years. Yeah, or obviously we're in a a lot more sensitive world, so I think a lot of the ones that have gone in the past probably wouldn't happen now. <laughs> yes, um, and people get a, a bit touchy with that sort of stuff, but um, I think we we're just right in the sweet spot where people could appreciate some 
light-hearted humor well done so all the ones that would tick the boxes was your responsibility and then no i'm not going to do that in case there's any um <laughs> I, I feel like i've got to read the bit at the bottom of any of those ads you know please please not brought you both. Yeah. <laughs> are you got anything for jimmy before we wrap up um are we gonna, we'll just get to some of these moments i was keen to you know cover those before we yeah, yeah, I, I waffled a little bit there. Sorry. No, 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 no. this is this is. I, I want to know about this the podcast um, is a waffle. So the Hawthorne game where you kick, have a kick after the siren. Yeah. So did, did, um, yeah, like, can you talk us through that? I mean, that moment of knowing that you can kick anything to win because it's only happened yeah. five times in history where you've kicked, where someone's kicked a point to win a game. Did, did you miss the shot before to equal the scores so you could kick after the siren yeah. to win the game? I, I missed a couple in that last quarter. I played in a number of spots that day because we had a couple of players go down. I think I was playing centre-half back at one stage. A very, very short centre-half back and disrespecting <laughs> the position, so my apologies. Yes, thank <laughs> you. Um, Accepted yeah. on behalf of Backman everywhere. <laughs> no, but uh, as you mentioned, uh, everyone carries on about a, a goal after Siren, but you've just highlighted it's a lot more difficult to kick a point after Siren with only five <laughs> to win. <laughs> um, now, w- w- what happened was I only had one really video, uh, one videotape growing up of football highlights, and it was like, I think it was season 87, 88, 89, which I used to watch on repeat, and it was Stephen Kernahan. Um, kicking one out on the full from that pocket, the MCG. Right. Yes, and where I marked across the face. Yeah, well, no, na- near side. Near. I missed near right. And so, as soon as I've marked it and gone back, as soon as I marked and gone back, the my only concern is kicking it out on the full. So, like, I go. So, actually, the way I line myself up is I actually aimed for the far goal post because then I thought, even if I shank it a bit, I've, I've sort of like accounted for that. It's like a golfer going, geez, I hit a really wicked slice. Yes. Let's aim down the left-hand side of the fairway. And I've hit it dead, stri- dead straight, which is just missed left side. So I'm thinking, no need to be a hero and try and like thread it through. Just get the point and get out of here and <laughs> let's, let's win. But what about uh, that huge moment in 2009? Uh, that's the toe poke from... Yeah, Scarlet. Scarlet. Yeah. Scarlet. You were, you were right there. Oh, wide the open. <laughs> <laughs> Chappy handball the ball. <laughs> no. Yeah, were you calling for it? Yeah, I was were, screaming for it. Um, but you were open. Yeah, wide open. Come on, chap. No, but <laughs> hey, unbelievable kick of the footy, Paul Chapman. Mm. And I think people, you know, they forget how skillful Paul Chapman was. And he was having a day out. And Paul Chapman snapping, it just goes through. Like, yes. Um, but, yeah, I was three metres away, straight in front, best view. And it was like, watch it go through. But it was one of those games like, <laughs> get my breath back, got to get back to the middle. Where's Lenny Hayes? <laughs> Don't let him get it for the last couple of minutes. Um, uh, it was, I've never been so exhausted after a game of football. I reckon it took me a month to get over that game. It was really? just brutal. Just brutal the whole whole game. After match, have anything to do with that? or just That didn't help the recovery process. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to drink out a couple of quaddies. It doesn't work, that, <laughs> surprisingly. <laughs> the, the ice bars didn't get a use out nah, after the grand final? Nah, no ice bars. Does anyone sit in the ice bars after winning a grand final? No, nah, you cop. Oh, you cop an absolute barrage. Yeah. You should too. Yeah, yeah. You no, flog. <laughs> You're not impressing anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Get out. Get out. Um, what about? Uh, I've got this question. Um, there's some. There's some sons running around for, yeah. uh, from that era. What? There's some father son footy coming Geelong's way in about what 2030. Yeah. Um, that sort of areas. Yeah, call it that generation. So oh four to call it 15, 16, most of the guys have had boys. I think there's only a handful of girls. So I think wow. there's over there's over 30 boys. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. Like, Correct. And everyone who's had girls, apart from Max Rooks, has still had boys. Like, yes. So, yeah, Joel Corey's got a couple. Lingy's got three. There's twos and threes everywhere. Matt Scarlett's got twin boys. That'd be frightening, manning up on them. Both at fullback. Back they just play two fullbacks. Yeah. <laughs> Paul Chapman's a couple of boys. Yeah, so... Boys, every the team. Yeah, that's I, it. I, mentioning Matty Scarlett, I remember a game sitting in the crowd again. All these moments that influenced my footy career. Right? Matty Scarlett, not a big goal kicker, well, at least for a lot of part of his career. He kicked this goal one day, and he, I think it was against it was Port Adelaide or Richmond. And whoever his opponent was, was in the goal square, the right goal square. And Scarlett had run down the field, bounces, kicked a goal. He had a standing ovation <laughs> for... Two or three minutes, running back by himself, just like <laughs> just trudging back to the back line. What was he like to play with, Matty Scarlett? Oh, unbelievable and um, ferociously competitive, and it like it permeated through the group. Not not a massive talker. Had a great skill of sledging not his direct opponent, but so, 
somebody else's opponent, which is a really clever thing to do. <laughs> Don't get your own. To fire someone else up. Fire someone else up. Um, I, I mean this seriously. There's not there's a number of players, but he's one player who helped recreate a position. Now, like fullback, run punch. Don't let your, your opponent get would, the ball. Would you like to apologise to Backman again? <laughs> no, but like... He, yeah, he, no, you're spot on. Spot he, on. See ball, punch ball. Yeah. He had, um, he had 29 touches in a grand final. Like, from full back. Like, he was extraordinary. And I saw him have games where he'd have 30. And he launched so much of our attacking play from back there and, you know, intercepting the footy. And probably the thing that surprised a lot of people, not an enormous guy to play the key post. Yeah. But just so quick and strong. Was he strong? Yeah. Those players that you touch you. and they're hard. It's like the skinny kid at school who could do like a hundred chin ups on or just hang on the monkey bars. He was like that sort of strong. <laughs> bone guy. strength. Yeah, real bone strength. <laughs> You're so annoyingly strong. Bo Waters, yeah. Like, yeah, that's the that's oh, yeah. the guy at West Coast that was like that. I mean he demonstrated by a few hits that he yeah. laid out, but you would you just t- you'd feel how strong they were. Yeah, hand a wall. Hands yeah. were strong. They'd grab you like mucking around and you go like let go, <laughs> let go. Um, um, sledging. Y- yeah, I was going to ask you about sledging because you you did a f- fair bit of that. Were you a bit of a sledger? No, I mean you got caught on microphone once, uh, uh, given a sledge, which ne- which rarely happens. Yeah, nah, no, no, I wasn't a big. Sledge. I mean, it wasn't. Like, I'll, I'll read. It says you don't. Would you remember what you said to um to Pierce? Daniel Pierce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just uh, you can hand that jumper. Pretty much, you can hand that jumper back and use it next week. You haven't got dirty. <laughs> but that was probably that's clever. Up. Yeah, I wasn't mean or anything. It was a bit of tongue in cheek. Yes. Uh, no, I wasn't a big sledger. Um, you'd have to take a, quite a lot to to get me to sledge, and I wouldn't miss when I normally sledge. But I had some I had some pretty good teammates to do it. I was normally out of breath. Who was who was the best throwing them out? Oh, uh, Andrew Mackey. Yeah, I've heard that. Constantly, constantly would not shut up. Would not shut up. Um, but for a guy who's never got his adult teeth, he should have been. Pretty quiet. He's, we looked at him and go, "You still got your kids' teeth?" <laughs> <laughs> and then he, you know, when people become self-conscious, like yeah. he, he then he then give you this gummy smile because you like he wouldn't want to show. You. <laughs> oh. No, oh, but uh, Andrew Mackey famously asked North Melbourne, "Do we only get two points because you're so shit?" <laughs> <laughs> Geez, they wanted to knock his block off for the rest of the day. <laughs> I do remember playing you guys when you were sort of towards, you know, in, mm. in the prime and, and West Coast sort of 2007, you know, towards 2010 where we won a wooden spoon. It was somewhere there and we would come and either come down and play Geelong, get our pants pulled down or you'd come over to Subiaco and absolutely pull pants down. And I do remember that attitude. You, you knew you were better than people, right? Geelong players. Yeah. It, it wasn't an, it, it was an arrogance, but it, yeah, it, it was almost like a res- little bit of a respectful arrogance. Like, Yeah, like, and especially that group never really changed. Like, we, yes. it was the same group and, you know, you would have done all, you know, your pre-game and forward scan. You know, it's the same blokes again, one or two changes. There's someone added in or out injured, but you had a confidence that you knew that if you played the right way that, most of the time we'd be able to crack the opposition. Yes. Just because we, we did it time and time again. So you just build this inner belief and confidence. But, um, yeah, there was some, some guys are good on the lip, but no, I never really got involved in that much. How's your role at GWS going? Director of footy on the board there? Yeah, it's been pretty good. And it's been, it's been great for me, actually, because, as we mentioned before, you can get a pretty insular or closed view um, just spending your whole life Football, Geelong, go which, to... Which is what you were, right? Yeah. Grew up in Geelong, drafted to Geelong. Yeah, you think football can be one complete way and I actually wanted to understand AFL, not, you know, and I know you people in the West, oh, it's the bloody VFL, like that. I actually wanted to get a greater understanding of the AFL and what's probably the most different club as far as the way it is um, from Geelong is Greater Western Sydney. Expansion, new... Rugby league territory, different population, yeah. different demographics, interstate. You're just completely the polar opposite as far as that. You know, you got a 160 years versus 10 years history, and plus the people involved uh, with the Giants, which uh, we got a mutual friend there. Um, we always had an informal arrangement, and it just became formal because he goes, "Well, why don't you get roll your sleeves up and help us?" Yeah, it's great. I did want to finish up on that, but. Made me think of a question that we spoke to Luke Shuey about, Norm Smith medalist, one sitting in front of us right here, 2011, you win the Norm Smith. Um, do you fo- what, do they tell you before you're up on stage if you won the Norm Smith medal or not? Yeah, they did. Um, but you, I was just like oblivious to it. Like I totally, he, he told me and I totally forgot. 
Because it, it's like the it's uncanny. It, it's like the it's like the last drinks at the pub. I love you. Like I, I, I love you. I oh, know I love you more. Uh, you know you're the best. Like and then some it. other bloke comes up. Yeah, and you're just doing that. Like you just you, every everybody love everybody. <laughs> like that sort of stuff. <laughs> and then you're sort of standing around there. And then I was standing next to Scarlo, Michael Long, who I loved watching play. Um, you know the the winner is and, and Scarlo then's like. He's hugging me and pushing me. He goes, oh, you've won. I go, oh, okay. <laughs> do I go up? Like, what do I do? And as I'm going up, um, the AFR goes, don't swear. Thank everyone. Thank the sponsors. Yeah, yeah sure. Must, no, be this, got must be the same guy for 20 years doing yeah, this, I reckon. Patrick, Patrick Keane or someone like that. Yeah, yes. I, it might have changed recently, but it was, I think it was Patrick Keane when, when we did it. Did you swear? Did you thank the sponsors? No, uh, yeah, yeah. Thank Collingwood, um, which I always find weird. Thanks for, for being a loser. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, it's, it's kind of weird, isn't it? Like when you think about it. But no, you you get all the thank yous. But I always sort of felt uncomfortable in that sort of stuff. Like, can the rest of the team yes get up here quickly? Luke Shuey told the same story you just told. It's like you listened to Luke Shuey and just told us. He, 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 he was told. Guy? No, he was told. Yeah. He forgot. He was waiting mm. for the Norm Smith to be read out, and he was like, "I wonder who won it." Yeah. But he'd been told that he'd won it. it it's weird because you've just played two hours of footy, and you get this euphoric rush of energy. And it's like then people are shoving a microphone in your, your face and going, tell us how you feel. And I, you can genuinely be lost for words, which doesn't make great TV. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, don't, I don't know how to describe it. <laughs> oh, you idiot. You're just another dumb football guy. Literally, I, it's been a childhood dream winning a grand final and it's happened. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Give us a, a complete diatribe. Yeah, I was going to say, do you want 25 years you, of my past? Well, to yeah, <laughs> yeah. Dom Sheeds after the grand final was one of the worst you'll ever see, and he just kicked the winning grand. <laughs> oh, is it? He couldn't even speak. He was he was that euphoric. It was he. It, he was just looking. I just want to. I just want to thank the boys, and we bloody did it. And we, we he was hot, mm. couldn't not didn't want to do his hair. <laughs> I, I, I I still find that kick incredible. I was covering it for radio, and I hope it's one of those. This is why I wish the old uh, grand final footy marathon comes back on. Yes, because that needs to be a kick that needs to be shown time and time again. Yes, like I'm still in awe of it. Drop punt. Like, yeah, it was funny. Like, I, <clears throat> I, I actually felt like he was gonna. Uh, I don't know. It's always easier after after the fact. Mm. But given I was backman back yeah. there, just spoiling things all day, uh, I, I was. We'd we'd actually missed a lot of guys. We we sort of kicked five or six points in mm. a row, and we're all over them. That just couldn't. And it sort of like felt like someone's got to kick. Like someone's gonna have to kick mm. one. On the law of averages and yeah. percentages, someone will kick one of these goals. So I wasn't sitting up. So I don't think I was setting up that, that thinking, oh, he's mm. going to miss it. Like, we're going to have to. It was like, I reckon he could kick this. If, if you put a like, a like a garbage bin like at the very height of the top of the goalpost, dead centre. Would have gone. It would have landed in that. Yeah. That, was, that was how straight it was. Yes. So, oh, I can't believe he's just done that. <laughs> yeah. Is that what you were at on radio? Yeah. I was, <laughs> I was like, <laughs> Are you kidding me? Yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> um that's it. We're done and dusted for our interview. Not quite done yet, Ooh. though, Jimmy. I've got a couple more to That's go. That's the first hour. We'll have we, a little nah, break. <laughs> we appreciate your time, mate. But it is time for social media, not social media. Oh, yeah, you I like, like it? I like yeah. what you've done there. Social media, where the people get to ask you the question. All you've right. heard what Dan and I have got to ask you. This is where we put it out to our fans, and they get to ask you the big hitting questions. Yeah. Don't know what is sitting here. Uh, Charlie's actually been building this as we've been talking, so we could cop anything right here. Connor Morrissey, music. Uh, I heard the 06 game when West Coast Eagles came from 54 down inspired the Cats to improve. Is that true? It is. A um, lot of steep lessons. It, it was all sort of stuff like, what do you do in this situation? How can you keep moving the ball forward? Um, it, it became a, a big training tool where, you know, different positions at stoppages, all that sort of stuff. Yes. Uh, M, uh, yeah, M Holly, 32. Uh, best opponent that you've played on? Or um, played on a lot of good ones. Um, I think the one or the moment or the game that stood out the most was I was playing my third game of footy, peak Brisbane Lions at the Gabatoire, and you walk the out Gabbatoire. the centre bounce. I'm playing game three. James Kelly's on debut. Cameron Ling's played about 40 games, and you're going, do I take Voss, Black, or Ackermanis? <laughs> and you go, this is going to be a long night. <laughs> so I think I ended up with Vossy. Oof. How did that go for you? Oh, he had a he had a field day. It's <laughs> Michael Boss. <laughs> I'm not going to pretend like I oh, I had 25. I was palming him off. All this sort of stuff. No, we got torched. 
Um, yeah, I, I, I think I thought this was going to be in here, so I wouldn't mind it if you wouldn't mind speaking about it. Tom Strauss. This um, one. Story behind the beard and what it raised awareness for. Yeah, so um, it was my last year at footy and I think you get, as we know, you get a bit more comfortable in your own skin as you, as you grow up through a footy club and um, it was to start conversations and raise awareness around domestic violence, something that I experienced and definitely my family experienced growing up and, and through life and the the thing I wanted to do with the beard was start the conversation. So when you guys, you know, take your kids along to the footy and you see um, Jimmy, I don't mind. I didn't mind the jokes. Oh, he looks like Ned Kelly. He looks like Grug. <laughs> uh, he looks like Happy Gilmore's caddy. Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump. All that stuff. After that initial uh, humour, it's already broken the ice, and then the parents could explain in an age-appropriate manner. You know, respect towards women, respect towards each other. So it was to start the conversation around domestic violence, which. The numbers are still pretty shocking in Australia. And then on the side of that, if I was able to raise some money for two um, charities on my line, which, which was Bethany, which does a lot of work in Geelong, and obviously the Rosie Batty Foundation. Yeah, wow. Because um, you, you did well with the beard. It was a good beard. <laughs> it, yeah, it was 200 days. And like you, it, I, I lent into a strength of mine. So um, the people who are watching on camera, I shaved 15 minutes ago. <laughs> Okay, He's like Homer, oh, Sim- yeah. Homer Simpson yeah, yeah. just yeah. grows back. No, I do grow a good beard and I let the hair go as well, but it, it did serve a good purpose for Mad Monday as well on a lot. And I, I did come as Happy Gilmore's caddy. Well done. Um, but yeah, it was 200 days. It was sitting almost on where your tie would sit. Yes. Um, you know, just like that a fair bit. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was your last year, 2016. Yeah. Yep. Um, did it correlate, but was it, was it something that you'd thought about? during the season um, that, you know, raising awareness around that and, you know, potentially it could be your last year of footy. I knew potentially it could have been. I hadn't settled on retiring. It's not like I go, oh, this is my last year. I still had a year to go on my contract and there was conversations with Geelong where they wanted to go and things like that. Um, and they wanted to move, you know, younger and start filtering more of those younger players through, which, as you can see, keeps them up near the top of the ladder. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So do you feel like you were... Uh, if you had a year to go on your contract, is that that's? Uh, I would have liked, like hindsight's a great thing. I would have liked to play another year because it was more so the fact that we're still competing. Yeah, like, oh, I miss out on a chance to win a premiership, and they went on and played finals and all that sort of stuff. And you played games that year. You played a lot of games. To yeah, sixteen, didn't you? Yeah, I only missed one game. Hmm. Yeah, which was a trip actually to go play Freo in the West. Just yeah. had a, a little bit sore having that yeah, week. Yeah, yeah, toes up for that one. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, do you think you were done? Twenty sixteen. Um, you wanted to play another year, obviously. So yeah, I would. Oh, look, I, w- I would have liked another one, but that was just because I thought Geelong was still contending. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, <clears throat> Shane Haddo, uh, is the Geelong team of 07 to eleven the greatest of all time? Uh, oh, look, I don't really get in into debates about whether it's Hawthorne or Sydney or another team from or Richmond. Um, look, I I feel bloody lucky that I get to when I become older and more washed up that <laughs> yeah when I have grandkids I, I can say all those names that we mentioned I got to play with them and it doesn't happen often in footy clubs when you you get a generation like that we always talk about it with sports or you talk about it in retrospectively but to be lucky enough to be a part of it it's pretty bloody awesome there's a strong chance that the answer to this question is absolutely not Tommy underscore five nine zero one uh do you have any memories of playing on SCOE yeah, I do actually. Bullshit. Yeah, I do. We played in in the West. I think I was playing forward, and he always was intense. Like he he was a classy, angry backman. That's great. And it was <laughs> like before even the first bounce. I think you got me for the first five minutes before I don't know. Some before you had thirty in the first. No, not at all. You tough guy to get away from because you you're quick and closing speed. Um, but he was always those backmen. Yeah, you know, forearm in the back and. And the ball's down the it's other end. I'll go, mate, I just want to go to the other side here. You. you can you can have it if you want. I don't want it right now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want this. You don't want this. Oh, shit. But a very difficult man to get away from. He, he's hard to, hard to get a kick on. That, that's no, no bullshit. He's I'll take that. I will ta- we'll take that from James Bartell. You quick, though. Yeah. I oh, were. Oh, I've always been. Under nine hurdles champion. Yeah, correct. Yeah. It started from a very young age. Yeah. Under nine state hurdle champion. Yeah, still record, still stands, sort of stuff. Yeah. Oh, eight hundreds. I used to run them as yeah, well. Yeah, you did actually. I knew that. Athlete. Yeah. Um, oh, I'm a bit rattled there. I just thought Jimmy would be like, absolutely no <laughs> idea, mate. We're yeah. too busy winning flags. So who you are you? 
<laughs> yeah, correct. Um, yeah, I apologise for that. I feel a bit, bit bad now. That's yeah, so, all right. So That's all right. Yeah, you probably no, won. Apologize. John Morrison. Uh, yeah, John Morrison. Um, no, this is a current question. If you don't answer it, you, you can do okay, it. Okay, so Geelong's list has been uh, star-studded for quite some time. Um, many ready-made players from other clubs. Uh, what's been the big hurdle in finals? Uh well, there's a couple of parts to that. I think what gets undersold is actually their own development as well. We focus on those older, experienced players coming in, but you forget Tom Stewart came from South Barwon via the VFL, developed him to one of the best backmen we're seeing. Yep. Atkins come from St. Joey's out of their VFL, developed now is starting in, in their midfield. Been a big turning point for them this year. Blitzarves hadn't even touched the footy. He was jumping over steeples. Yes. Two-time best and fairest multiple Australian. Yeah, add in Myers was a late pick. Stengel was a shrewd pick. Mm. Um, you, you keep going through. Henry was a rookie list pick. Jeremy so, Cameron is a wash away GWS yeah, player. Yeah, you he, couldn't he, keep him. He was a castaway. No, but, <laughs> but I think what gets undersold a lot is actually what they do themselves as well. And a lot of people focus on those older guys that they've been able to turn called buy low, sell high sort of, if you're using a stock term. They've been mm. able to create some big depth i think the difference from this year is they've got a higher top end than they have in previous years but they've been competing top four but geelong don't beat themselves well disciplined well organized but i think in previous years probably their worst games probably sit at the six yes. so their best games would be a seven and a half but you look yes. this year their top end is amazing at the moment so they can get up to a nine now so yes. i reckon just got a better top end this is uh it's my brother jess Jason Nelson. Is this the one who was the Brad Ottens? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, is he just gloating? Is that his correct. How good am I? Yeah, correct. Uh, is it the one there that I'm highlighting there? Yeah. Okay, um, Jimmy, when you retired, you were still playing good footy. Um, did you get to, uh, get to make a call or was your hand forced? So we've covered that a bit. Yeah, second, yeah. second part, more interested. Uh, were there offers from other clubs at the end of your career and during latter parts of your career after Norm Smith? Um, no, because I never really entertain them. So I think you can entertain them by your conversations with you have with your manager or things like that. I just never opened myself up to that discussion. I, I locked myself away in, in contracts pretty early. So you take that off the table. And um, I don't know, I, I just felt if I'm retiring, I'm retiring from football. I haven't even played any local football or anything like that. I've just I'm sort of done. Yeah, so you didn't play any footy after you finished? No. no all that, I got offered... Um, I don't know, it's just a personal point of view. I've been offered a number of times over the years to come and play, you know, three games in finals. but it, And you, you can get some good coin out there doing it, but it just never sat comfortably with me. Um, and that'd be because I... Say if you're, you're a club and you've got a 17, 18-year-old kid who's played... He's been there since December, November, pre-season. He's played 15, 16 games at half-back, for example. And then I come in and play the last three games and he misses out on a premiership. It just doesn't sit comfortably with me about building a local footy club. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I never took it up. Yeah, that's a very, very mm. good point. I actually feel a similar way, even though no one's offering me any money to come down <laughs> and play for you and kick out of the goal square. But the same thing, I would feel bad going to a footy club. I've mean, no, no history with, yeah. no mates, um, and to take someone's spot because someone's going to miss out. You don't yeah. just, they don't have 17 players running around. They need an 18th player to say, hey, yeah. Jimmy, come join in. It'd be a bit different if I said, yeah, look, I. Because of things, I'll play a dozen games and I've been involved and things like that. But just to get the minimum to get yourself qualified mm. and then play finals, I, I don't know. I just doesn't sit right with me. We'll give Jace one more go. He's sitting in a hospital bed. so he's The he's, second one I've got yeah. there highlighted. Um, yeah. As a midfielder, who's the footy so well? How, how frustrating is it now watching mids obsessed with possession um, stats stats, and butchering footy <laughs> playing selfish footy to get those shit stats <laughs> <laughs> this is pretty aggressive yeah <laughs> he's got a few people in mind he's left uh, out their yeah, names yeah, yeah. I, feel, I feel that's pretty loaded that yes. question yes um, now well, because I wasn't a super athlete of course like um, the game and the football IQ and the skill is, is important to me and that's the way I watch footy so that's why I enjoy watching footballers more than anything else so I kind of lean into that question a, a little bit that yeah, I do get frustrated when players uh, consistently make bad decisions or they don't use the ball correctly or, or think their way through it. But I don't hold a grudge against it. I probably just fall more in love with the players who do it well. So, mm. um, yeah, I, I probably can't back back them up too. Doesn't like. have the passion. Doesn't have the passion of a fan. Yeah. They're not, they're not, they're not yeah. kicking it well. They don't want to come off his shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, last one, Peter McCann, the very last one on the on the on the run sheet. Because yep. you you had one of these in your arsenal for sure. Uh, should a torpedo be mandatory when having a shot on goal from outside fifty? Absolutely, <laughs> I love the torpedo. Um, I I used to kick them all the time. It used to actually it became part of my my training program. So the game can be pretty serious, as we know, and um, your sports scientists or as they've been called, phys editors. Yes. Um, I remember having a big argument one day and it was about 100 metres away because I'm not walking over there. Get off the field. After, you know, a captain's going, go, nah, you do a quarter. I go, well, that's my problem. Yes. Like, you're not playing at the MCG. Yes. You, you do your job, I'll do my job. Sort of conversation because the game can be really serious. And so what I'd like to do is grab some footies. I'd even go to a local oval, kick some goals. You've got to remember sometimes why you played the game. Mm. And it's fun. And so kicking barrels out of training, kicking some snaps down at the local park, that, that sort of gave me that, um, I guess, reminder that the game can still be fun. That's why you played it. Bring the goat down to training. You're thinking <laughs> of playing a grand final. Yeah. <laughs> this is not a Scotia question, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, did you kick any nine pointers in the preseason? Ooh. Yeah, I think I did. I think I, I got one. It was when one of the f- first years. I, I think I got one. It was when, I'll get the ground wrong, but it was like, Northern Queensland, somewhere it was like Townsville or somewhere like that. I got a nine pointer, which I think it was bag, it? bag of balls, back bag to of Bell footies, Park. bag yeah. of footies back to Bell Park. Yeah, nice, unreal. Yeah. Um, that's it, mate. Done and no, it was a lot of fun. Good yeah, man. We it. appreciate your time. Um, we, we've hung around longer than we could have ever wished for. So thank you, mate. Thanks to all of our supporters, our sponsors, Whippersnapper, uh, Blue Bet. Muggle River Roasting Co., Leadable Cameras, and Shelter, of course. We love them. Thanks to our patrons. You can find everything on socials, backchat double underscore. If you're watching, you can listen to us as a podcast. If you're listening, you can watch us on YouTube. Find everything you need at backchatpodcast.com.au. Like all that? See you next time.